Greg has lived and worked in the Greater Portland area for over 50 years. Uh, in addition to his art making practice, he's also been an art educator. Uh, I'm sure as many of you know, he taught for a good while at USM. Uh, and he's also taught and lectured at many other places, including Mecca, Bates, Bowdoin, um, and that's just here in Maine. Uh, he was also the administrator for the Maine Arts Commission, where he oversaw the Percent for Art program. Uh, he also was a recipient of the Public Art Commission and Artist Fellowship from the Maine Arts Commission. His work in, is in collections both uh, domestically and internationally, uh, and they're in multiple museums, including the PMA, the Farnsworth here in Maine, the de Cordova, uh, the Fog Art Museum at Harvard, and the British Museum. Uh, overall, his work is in more than 500 corporate and private collections uh, worldwide. So thank you, Greg, for being here, and the floor is yours. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for coming this evening. Um, I probably will give you a little bit of information about those, uh, those questions that you might have about process to begin with, but I like to kind of open things up to questions pretty quickly. I, I like the way that that leads into some of the subjective aspects as well. But um, this process is one that um, I've been working on for decades and it came about uh, initially by destroying a painting. I, had, I was working on canvas and paper and I decided that I wanted to remove all the paint and take it down until there was nothing there and start over again. And when I got to that point, I realized that I'd found something that was more important than I'd been looking for intentionally. And so I started looking at what was actually left? What were the traces that I found so interesting? And that started an investigation with materials that would allow me to do this um, trace evidence of paint and process that gets built on the panel. And eventually what I, what I did was moved into wooden panels because it gave me a lot of resistance so I could compress materials and um, put a lot of um, physical um, effort into how those layers got built. And then I discovered that gesso was something that I not only needed to have, but also was something that was going to be um, a, a medium of sense rather than just a protection. So these things started with about anywhere from 20, 30, sometimes 40 layers of gesso. And that part can take um, several months for a panel to get up to the point of where it can actually be painted on. And so what happens is uh, I paint with gesso, it dries, I sand, I paint, dry, sand, over and over on multiple panels until we get to, I get to a point where um, I have built up enough layers so that I can remove that gesso down to a point of where it has the texture of somewhere between highly polished marble and glass. It's, it's uh, there's, when you put, when you touch the surface of it, you feel no texture at all. And but instead of something like metal, which can have that surface, or glass, gesso has a little bit of a microscopic tooth to it that holds paint. And that's kind of the, the sort of magic that holds what's, what you see here on the surface. Because there's almost no paint here at all. Um, and that cannot happen on paper or on canvas. It's only this, this kind of compressed space that allows that to happen. Um, and I'm not working with paint that comes out of a can or tubes or whatever. What I'm doing is working with the elements of paint. I'm taking oil and wax and other mediums, and I'm taking um, powdered pigments and graphite and other powdered metals 
that have uh, various um, uh, fineness to the to the ground powders, and those the variation of the fineness of those particulates allows for some of the activity that you're actually seeing here. There's a, um, a chemistry that goes on with building these things. And my history, um, going back to the beginning of being an artist, was, uh, was more focused on science. I was interested in chemistry and mathematics and physics. And those um, endeavors, I think I, I brought to the art making process. I never was very comfortable with using brushes or looking at things and depicting things. What I wanted to do was to build things. And so I think about these in a very um, architectural way or, or sculptural way, where I'm, I have this panel, I build these layers of, of white gesso, and I sand and finish and um, create this environment to add what you are seeing in the end. Um, that process of building the, building the paint um, is a very a chemical and physical process so that if I push physically on something, it reacts a certain way. If I push with a chemical in a certain way, it acts slightly differently. And so as I'm working with these materials, I'm having a, a physical dialogue and a physical engagement with those materials and then discovering what the paint becomes. I, I never have a paint that in mind that I'm going to make for a painting. The paint comes about as a, as a process that, uh, that starts with you know, the, the structure of it. The, the other thing that I do is that I work in with geometric systems and um, I use mathematical formulas and what I like to call strategies. If you sort of think about them as like a chess board, you've got, it's all broken up into very rational units and there's ways to move things around that board. And then if you think about that being a thousand layers with all these different possible strategies that are moving up, over, down, across, whatever, and then compressing that all into something that's about two microns thick. And it's, so that chemical, physical ideation um, is unique for each piece. They're never um, the same. And um, it's not that I don't know where they're going, but I, I, I allow them to take me places. And then I in, encourage the opportunities that they provide, and then I take those. Um, so the, 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 the other thing that the mathematics does is um, it has a, a rationality to it and a, um, a manageability to it so that I can say, this is two inches, this is four inches, um, this has this precise amount of thickness, uh, this panel is this size, this unit is, has a certain relationship, a ratio to the panel, um, and I can keep making these um, mathematical um, directives between the various units that I've set up. And it would be kind of like if you took you, you bought everything to build a house for and you just dumped it in a yard and said, okay, like how am I going to move these boards around and what piece am I going to put over here with no idea that you're going to actually build a house, that you're going to just align these materials or these, these um, 
um, objects with the intent of it actually telling you what it wants to be. And, but you're there to um, make decisions about, okay, I'll let that happen, or no, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to stop that from moving any further. I'm going to get in the way of it. So it doesn't become just a runaway process that I don't have control over anymore. Um, the, the, what I found with working with um, very simple mathematic um, equations is that you know, things as simple as adding and subtracting and dividing, not very complex computations, that they can evolve into things that are very complicated, even based on just very simple uh, elements. And they often will come back around onto themselves and redefine their origins as you're pushing them so that the more you push that math, that math and those materials, the more it resists and the more it wants to continue to reassert its identity no matter what you're trying to do with it. So that, that leading, resisting, controlling, letting go, um, all that thing is part of how I make the paintings. There's also the, the, the color. The, these are not really um, bright and they're, they're not primary colors. They have, they're quite complex and they're quite rich and dark and earthy. And that is more a result of the the sort of underlying nature of the materials itself, like I'm working with earth elements, and they have that kind of quality, and instead of trying to take them out of that, I want to, to exalt in their richness, like to, to um, bring this piece of rust up to a shiny diamond kind of quality to it, because it all, it, it has that, in its nature, it just needs encouragement to bring it to that point. And um, the people often will say, well, how long did it take you to do this piece? And it, for me, it's like it was long enough. It <laughs> <laughs> It was not too long, it just was enough time to make it. And it's, some pieces race there and some don't. They, some hold back. Um, there is a painting that's in my dining room right now that I, um, that I have never had on the market that about every five or six years I work on it again. And it was a piece that initially resisted a lot. It just did not want to go in any place that I wanted it to go. And I'm going, fine, you know, well, just, that's fine. You can do whatever you want with this. And I just let it be that. And then I'd go back and I'd go, no, we're gonna go back here. And we're gonna do this again. And we're gonna go even way further than we did before. And so this is my opportunity to say that um, I have a piece in my life that will always be in progress, that will never, there is never going to be time enough for that piece to be done. And one thing I've learned by that is that, um, you know, what is a finished work of art? When do you say that, that it's done? And you know, there's all kinds of rationale that you can come up with for saying that something's complete. And then at the same time, you can come up with all sorts of rationale about how nothing's ever complete. Everything is always going to be unfinished. Everything is going to always be evolving. Um, and so it's where I end with these pieces is usually uh, a place where I feel comfortable that 
it can tell me as much as I can tell it. And it has enough for, to stand on its feet to command my attention and maybe somebody else's. And um, it has enough of its life that it maybe is, is saying something more than I can even understand or, or, or know about. And, and when I have a sense of that, I feel, okay, I, I probably should just leave this alone for a while. Or maybe I should never go there again. And so, in some ways, they're like people. Um, they, you know, it's like you can't say, I know that person. Uh, you kind of never really completely know someone, and you never stop learning about someone. And for me, making art is like that. I'm always learning more about that piece and where that piece is going to go and what it means. Um, <clears throat> There's, there's a bunch of things that happens within the, the strategies that I talked about. And the way that I, um, when I'm actually working, I work flat on tables. I work on a table that is immovable. It can, if you, no matter what you do, you cannot move it. It's, it's complete resistance. And I find that that works very well for what I'm doing to these things. They look, they are very fragile and they look very delicate, but I have been, when I work on them, I'm putting every bit of my physical strength into them. They're very physically demanding. And so I want that resistance. And when I'm working with the, the strategies, there are so many strategies and there's so many elements to the strategies that I can't keep those in my head. So my work table becomes a drawing surface. And so my, the panels here and the entire rest of the table is, is, is sort of like shrink wrapped in paper. And I draw on the paper and then paint and I draw on the paper and paint. And the, the drawings aren't complete because they would take as long as the paintings. And so working on separate pieces of paper doesn't work for me either because they get shuffled around or they pile up. And so what I do is I, I, I draw my environment around me as I'm working on the painting. And I can refer to all those strategies at any moment. I can look here and see what happened with those 47 units that are an eighth of an inch wide and how they relate to these units over here that are in eighths. And I can't do that completely in my head, but I can do it by looking at the references that I've set out on the, on the, on the paper. And so these, these, the surface of the table becomes very dense with information. And if you saw those drawings, you could see the, um, the evolution of the painting. But it, you, if you saw any one of those strategies, it wouldn't look like anything that you're seeing here. It's those strategies complement, annihilate, cover up, encourage, meld, mingle. They, and then those, some of the strategies stay firm and resist and some dissolve. And so there is um, a, a dimensional degradation and a dimensional um, um, re resistance to anything that I'm trying to do to it. Um, so why do I do that? <laughs> like, <laughs> Why all those, those numbers and why all those strategies and what happens? Why, why would I want to do that? Um, what I've discovered is that I can get, and I know people will find this hard to believe, but I can get kind of obsessive about things. <laughs> And so I need something to kind of rein myself in a little bit. 
Otherwise, I could just go and I would never surface in this. And, you know, some people might find that, you know, maybe a mental illness or something, but I'm channeling into something that I think that's more useful than my demise. But, um, so it's, that's one thing. <laughs> But there's also a thing that happens is that um, when you have something as rational as a square or a grid or uh, parallel lines, um, th there's a certain comfort level to understanding that. I mean, everyone knows what a square is. And it's like if I go, if I go this distance and turn 90 degrees, this happens. That is so predictable and so comforting in the knowledge that you are, um, you're in a reality that you, you understand. But what I find in this is that it's very deceptive because we become complacent in that understanding and we stop looking at the contradictions that are in that uh, predictability. And the more you dig into that, the more unsettling it becomes because suddenly you're beginning to find out that everything that you thought was very balanced and ordered and predictable is about ready to dissolve and not be there at all and you don't know anything about it. And that could be okay or could be frightening I, I suspect if your life was completely without any kind of order, it might be a little unsettling. But those are things that we encounter everywhere in our lives. There's those surprises of, uh, of things that we feel that we have the complete grasp of and when we actually don't. And so what begins to happen when you look at these is that the more you look, the less you understand. At first you go, okay, I, I get it. Like I get that this is doing, there's, there's these three colors and there's these horizontal and vertical elements and stuff. But then I get closer and I'm going, oh no, at, behind this is all this atmospheric linear information that looks very chaotic, but I can't really see it because it's been buried by rationality. And, but then it's still creeping around there and it's not, been annihilated or removed, and so you're setting up the simultaneous emotional and physical um, circumstances. And those, um, I find those simultaneous conditions to be something that is very human. And it's not necessarily that one dominates the other or, or one always triumphs because it's not, a, it's not a fight that's going on here. And it's neither or none of the elements need to have um, a resolution. It is a collection of, of sometimes contradictory, sometimes um, you know, unrecognizable uh, relationships. There's a, a whole range of things that are happening that are, are different and they don't line up and they don't tell, a they don't give you a, a specific narrative and they don't give you an identity um, or at least an identity that's stable. The, the identity is, is, is shifting, evolving, um, and when it, what starts to happen, instead of trying to figure it out, it's, these are not so much puzzles that you need to figure out, like, how, like, how does this work? You know, I'm, not, I'm seeing this, but it doesn't follow through on what I'm seeing. There's something here that interrupts my thought as I'm moving through that and trying to look at what seems to be very mechanical and very deliberately uh, laid out. Um, what happens there? And in that process, I think people 
um, have an opportunity to be reflective of what, what is it about themselves that they're actually discovering as they're looking at these pieces. It's, you're not so much figuring it out and going, oh, I get it, I know what it means, um, I know what it is, I know what its identity is, and I know how it relates to my reality. What it is is like none of those things, but somehow that feels very familiar. It feels like the less I know, the less I understand, the more confused I am, the more fearful I am, the more comfortable I am, because I know that's, like, that's something that's, that is really who I am. Not everyone goes to the same place when they look at any work of art, and not everyone is going to go where I go w with this work. But I think that um, the, the, the one thing that I'm trying to do here is to set up something that's really rational and precise and measured and concrete and mathematical, and then just say, it's not true. It just isn't true. It's way more complicated than that. And it's way more interesting than that. Um, because I could be much more precise and much more exacting using AI or computers or whatever, but if I'm going to make every one of these sixteenth of an inch lines by hand, there's something that, has, that happens both with my hand and with my brain that's human. And that human element is like the, the tiny little vibration that's in there that makes it alive and not a machine. Not that machines are bad or can't do some very interesting things, but um, it, for me it's a way of, of exposing the beauty that underlines a lot of the, of the things that we think that we understand. Um, that's a sort of start. <laughs> and I could probably go on and on here, but um, I think in order to get to some things that you might have more uh, concerns or questions about, I'm just going to open it up and we can, oftentimes this takes me and you and us to a place that even reveals some more. So if you've got a, a question, by all means ask me. Yes? It feels like, like these could be played in, in, in music. You know, it feels like there's a there's sort of a harmonic quality to it, like you could have a symphony here. Does music play a role at all, or, or sound? Well, the, um, yes. Um, and on, a, on a lot of levels. Um, I always listen to music when I'm making art. Um, music has a, uh, also a, a kind of mathematical progression. It, it's made up of units and divisions of units and a combination and overlay of sounds. And so there is a lot of uh, analogies to that. Um, I don't necessarily um, uh, make these with the intent of them to being about music, but they are very, music is a, an element that I think is, is, is one of the elements that would makes a lot of sense in terms of thinking about them. Yes. Yes. Um, I love the work. Thank you. And it's very architectural, but it's very process oriented. I'm wondering what your relationship is to textiles. And I'm sure I've been brought up before. I just don't, I haven't read, I don't know. Um, but there seems to be a, a process that relates. They, they speak to me. Yes, they do. And I, I look at a lot of textiles. Um, you know, it's... Um, 
And that, that's, you know, I, I love the idea of like a thousand threads, <laughs> you know, like, yes, I can relate to that, a thousand units that are all exactly the same, but then some are brought forward and pushed back and so forth. And so there's the, definitely a relationship to textiles. I love the, the woven part of it, and I also like the way that um, they um, can, can bend and be made into things that can be folded. And, and sometimes I think about my, um, a lot of this seems like flat on top of flat that creates dimension, but sometimes for me it feels like I'm rolling things up. And, um, or that I'm, I have this and it's kind of origami-like folding up and then pressing it really down. Or like I'm making pastry and I'm rolling out and folding and rolling out and folding and I'm creating a thousand layers of butter between each layer of, of uh, dough. That sort of thing is here for me. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of uh, activities in, in our daily lives, like our clothes or making clothes, um, the things that, the way we plant crops and the way we grow food and the, the units, like, okay, here's a seed, here's a billion seeds, and these billion seeds can create this and they can create gigantic fields of, of like undulating form and color and so forth. That sort of thing, I am, you know, is something that, that resonates very strongly for me. So any of those kinds of things, I find that I bring in. Now, it's not so much like, okay, this is a cornfield that I'm doing here, but I, I may think about those alignment of seeds and what, and then the growth thing with, with, with plants, um, I'm also a gardener, and that's something I've done my entire life. Um, and there is an element of, of, of time in all these pieces that relates to something like growing something. Um, one thing I just thought of in relation to something I said earlier in, and also with what you said was that I don't th think that these pieces so much give you um, give, give you a thing or give you an answer, but they give you space. They give you space and time to, to go somewhere. And that somewhere is usually you. Because why would you go anywhere else? <laughs> because you're the one who's in here, and it's like you're not looking for somebody else. You're not looking. So the obvious thing is, like, how do I find myself in this work? And how do I find the patterns in my life that I see here? And, you know, what are the things here that I recognize is, is something that I do every day. Um, so yeah, there, you know, there's, there are things like textiles or other um, forms, you know, architecture, it goes on and on. Um, I look at those sort of things in in sort of macro science and micro science and looking at how when I look to smaller and smaller and smaller units and how they, like, okay, I can make units this small, but I can only go so far because I'm human. But then, you know, there's, there's telescopes and there's microscopes and you can keep looking for those patterns and those contradictions um, in infinite directions. And I, I sort of see myself as an artist and my art in particular as being like a spherical entity, that I'm not so much moving through this from point A to B to C, but I'm kind of moving 
outward away from myself and then back into myself. And that that looking in and, and then coming back out is expressed with these materials and where I end up taking them. Um, there, there might be a situation where I know I, what I want to do is I've, I've worked out some diagrammatical information that has an interesting evolution of numbers. And so I translate that into a graphic design, and then I reduce that in size to like one-tenth or something. And then I'm going to put that out there as, okay, that's, um, that's the air that's in this piece. Now where is the structure that ad is added to that air? And so where is the next strategy of my world that needs to come in here to provide that, that, that structure? And then where is the elements that allow it to dissolve? Is, um, because it always dissolves. And I'm not so much interested in bringing a piece up to a static place, but also allowing it to say, no, it's only gonna be here for a couple of minutes and then it's gonna go somewhere else. And that's why when you move by these pieces, they say this, and then they say this, and then they say this, and then they say this. And I have figured out that, oh, this thing wants to keep telling me different things. And so here's a way for me to encourage that to do it more. So that, um, you know, people who, who photograph my work have a real hard time <laughs> <laughs> like, well, which one do you want me to photograph? Because this is one thing, but over here is something else. And is a video better? But also, is the video is only certain light in certain time. And so there's, there's only a way to kind of hint at um, what your experience is going to be. Because these are not about them, they're about you. And that's, um, that's what I'm trying to give out when I'm finished. <laughs> that's an awfully long answer, wasn't it? <laughs> See, that's my problem. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it, um, there's, a, there's a, a few different things that happen. Um, I, I always work in, in, in bodies of work, uh, and I think a lot of artists do, uh, that, okay, here's a piece, and then, like, where do I go next? And then this is the next piece, which is bringing some of the experience from the last piece to this one. And then you go, oh yes, these two are sort of saying something. And so, well, where would be the next place that I'd like to take this? Because I can't keep taking all those places in one piece, because I never get anywhere. So I have to come out of here and go somewhere else. And so this, this, this body of work starts to build up. And then they gang up on me. <laughs> it's, they're, they're literally surrounding me, and they are saying, okay, go here next. Like, uh, this is where you should really, like, you, could, you should check this out. It looks cool over here. Um, and so when you say, do I have a plan of where to go, it's kind of like they're telling me where to go next. But then when I'm in a piece, it's like I'm completely open to 
um, this is where I am today, this week or whatever, and I'm going, I see its limitations, I see its possibilities, now I'm going to impose something really different on it. And I think what this is going to do is change it in a way that will do this. And invariably what happens, it doesn't do that. It does something else. But that something else is way more interesting than anything that I would have thought about doing. And so I'm setting up these things to help myself get to things that I don't know how to get to. And they, so they, I, I don't always know where I want this to go, but I, I know where I don't want it to go, and I know what I'm capable of how I'm capable of going there and what I have to work with. I know all those things. And they're all kind of, it's infinite. And so it depends on the body of work and it also depends on just where I am in my life. Um, you know, I've done, I don't know, a couple thousand paintings and there's, I've long forgot most of them that I've, I've done, and that's fine. Because um, for me, as an artist, it's, it's kind of like breathing, or meditating, or running, or swimming. It's, it's like a, a state of mind that I go into and stay in there. I mean, some people go, my God, how do you measure the same measurement like 200 times? And it's like, I, I don't, I'm just in a stream that happens to be having all these units that are repeating itself over and over and over and over again. And instead of it being like, oh God, it's such a task. How many have I got? How long have I been doing this? I've got 50 more to do. It's like, I don't, I don't count, I don't keep track of the work that I just float with it. And for me, it's not so much enduring the process, but just swimming in it and, and letting it take me wherever. Um, it's exhausting, but you know, what isn't? <laughs> Yes. I'm thinking about the fact that something that John alluded to in the beginning about the process. And without your description of this process, but more importantly, what it means for you and how you would hope that we would know, how could we know? In other words, the thing that we see is the process. And is there, is there any way that we could understand what you go through, what you, what you think, how it's so human, what you're doing, and yet the pieces are a process? Am I making sense here? I, th I think so. If, I, if, if I'm following, I'm, if, 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 I'm, if I'm off, you can bring me back. But... Um, it's, there, there's, there's two things. I, th I think there, there is sort of an innate human need to understand. Um, like, what is that? Like, not just what does it mean, or what do I feel, but like, just what is it? Um, and, Sometimes if people have seen certain work of mine, uh, some of it kind of approaches that in some of this, but um, there is times where people go, is that metal? Or is that wood? Is that stone? Like, and I'm saying, no, it's paint. And I'm going, no, that's not paint. It doesn't look anything like paint. Um, it looks like maybe oxidation or a stain, 
or you know, some kind of a, it's dust that settled on something. And all of that is what it actually is. And also, for me, the fact that you can't figure it out is, is a helpful thing because you don't get caught up in like beating yourself up like I can't figure it out. Like how does he do this or what are these materials what that result in this? It's like you don't have to think about it. Just give yourself over to it. And, and that's very hard to do, I think. Um, some people would just say, well, you know, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to know or I'm out of here, and that's fine too. But it, it, in some ways, not knowing is, is a way of knowing more. Uh, like I was saying earlier about the more you see, the less you understand, but the, the more comfortable you are in that, you feel better knowing less, and that's not so much an ignorance is bliss sort of thing, it's, it's kind of like a higher intelligence. It's, uh, it's not ignorance at all. Um, it, it's, um, it's taking a, an understanding of it beyond the obvious, beyond the thing that it um, is trying to trick you into believing it is, or it's denying you the information. And neither of those things need to be resolved. They can just be space for you to think about how you fit into that space. I don't know if that... No, thank you. Yeah. Right. Um, I think over, over time, I've um, I, I think that I, I used to do um, tighter variations from piece to piece, so that when you would see a body of work, say there was 12 pieces, you could see how they really related to each other. And even though they were separate individual pieces that had their own natures, there was real strong connections. And I think at this point, I think I, 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 I'm taking like deeper looks into the identity of each piece. And so like the piece that's over there under the title of, is very apparently very different than this piece, but they were done together at the same time, side by side, like on the table at the same time, and thinking the same way, but that's where they went. And, and so they're the same size, but they're different orientations, one's vertical, horizontal, but they're the same units, they're all, all the same things are there. Even most of the colors are there. The, the reds and browns you see here are in that painting, but they're not as dominant. 
And so that's like taking, okay, here's like, okay, we're gonna make two cakes. And in this cake, we're gonna put all the same ingredients and over here we're gonna all the, but we're gonna bake this one at 100 degrees for five days. <laughs> and this one over here, we're gonna, we're gonna bake it like 800 degrees for five minutes. And like, what happens to those cakes? They have the same ingredients, but they're not gonna look anything alike. That's maybe kind of, I've never used a cake analogy like that. <laughs> but, but you sort of see what I'm saying, that there's, I'm, I'm taking a deeper um, look into the possibilities of where I can veer off with the same information without leaving my sort of train of thought, actually. Mm -hmm. got, got a uh, simple question from an uh, online viewer. Yes. Did you say this was from Diamond? Yep. Okay. Diamond works here, by the way. Uh, what kind of music do you listen to? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I listen to a lot of electronic music. Um, but that's not a finite thing. Um, there can be times when I'm more... I, my, I can drift off into things that, that are uh, mood enhancing, like kind of reparative things. But a lot of, the, a lot of electronic music is that, that continuous information that's coming at you, and it's repetitive nature, but then it's depth of overlays and so forth. Um, that's, uh, for a lot of people, th they find that kind of assaulting. For me, it's comforting. <laughs> <laughs> I also kind of like noise. Like, um, noise can be something that, um, once you get past its irritation, noise can be really wonderful. <laughs> that's possible. <laughs> But I can I can talk with Diamond more about that. <laughs> like I said, you may be crazy to find this for us tomorrow. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, can you talk about the shadows in this one? Why why are they different colors? Are they reflecting? Well, yeah. It, there's um, I there there's only two of these, and then the small vertical box piece does that to some extent. But if you really, I'm sure you've, you've noticed that there's, because all the sides are painted, even if they're flush against the wall or if they're floating off the wall, but there's, besides the edges being painted to, to reinforce the idea of objectness, they also have a way of bending light. And it also, that, when the light is being bent, it has to go somewhere. And so it bleeds up onto the walls. Like that one, it's, it's pretty dramatic because the top of that is yellow and you see this yellow glow that's coming up from the top of it. These are different colors because there are different color panels. Um, this has, if you're here, it may look almost black, but it's actually red. And this side over here, it appears to be kind of tan, brown or something, but it really is green. And, and then light does interesting physical phenomena, the way it bends and breaks up things and 
the way that pigments absorb and reflect light. But um, that, that was, I, I, a number of years ago, I did um, a lot of shaped things to play around with, you know, pushing the shadow aspects of it. And I, I, I still like doing that, but I also like the fact that you can see these little tiny units shooting up off the top of it like teeth that are coming up, up the very top of it. They're very subtle, but they're there. And that kind of just extends the dimensionality of the paint. Um, so the paint isn't just staying where it's supposed to be. It's going out into the environment, literally, onto the walls. And then when the, there's, this was, show was not about scale, but I also do really large work also. Um, you know, up to 12, 15 feet. And that work is very different because it's so immersive. Um, when you're in a room or even, even a space this big and you're working on something that scale, um, it, it's, it takes more than just your eyes. It takes your body and controls everything about your movement. You know, you have to, you, you have a different relationship with it. Um, it's, and it's just a different one. It's not better, um, but it is a, there's a different physicality to that kind of immersiveness. But not, not to mean that something very small can't be very immersive. Like that little white piece back there. That one has humor, too. We it, What's that? We thought that one had humor. Yeah. You were pretty cheeky with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's... Uh, I'm not entirely humorless. <laughs> you might think that looking at this, but um, yeah, I mean, there's sometimes I will do something with these things and it will just, I'll sit there and laugh for like 10 minutes because I'm just so like amused by what it did. And, um, and then to go, oh, okay. So I'm gonna take this joke I just figured out and put it over here so you all can have the same laugh, but maybe, maybe you want. <laughs> those, are, those are things artists do for themselves, right? That they, they, uh, they can write some of their history in there that's for themselves. Uh, where the, the raw gesso is visible? The no. No. Um, the, the gesso, I, I, I talk a little bit more about that. It's, it's a very important part of the process. Um, you all probably know, if you're artists, know Golden, that makes um, paints and um, John Golden, I think, the guy who started that, and Beverly Hallam, who was a main artist, a woman who's deceased now, but who lived in York County, uh, were co-inventors of acrylics. And she kind of got screwed in the process, but anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but the, acrylics had its start here. But anyway, Golden is a good, company to work with, they'll, they, they can indulge in a lot of artists' eccentric requests. And so the gesso that I use, they make for me. It's my formula. And they have an army of chemists that work there to produce their paints and their gels and their mediums and they make hundreds, thousands of products. And <clears throat> the gesso I need needs to respond in a certain way or it won't work at all. It, it, none of this will happen without this particular gesso. And, and so they were willing to work with me to tweak it and 
you know, adjust it, have it be higher solid content, um, less, you know, vinyl or acrylic contents, make it more sandable, make it sandable in a more specific way. And the more control I had over the gesso, the more I could do what I'm doing. And they'll, they'll do that for you. It's, it gets kind of pricey. Like, you know, they may charge you a couple hundred dollars a gallon for paint, but they'll, they'll then they keep all those formulas on file. And they also, the, the chemists, when I've dealt with them directly, most of the time they're figuring out mundane stuff. And so when someone comes and says, I want this, 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 and they go, oh, right, we've got a challenge here. And so they, they like getting onto something that is, takes them off their usual, like, oh, I have to come up with a new product that's going to sell you know, all over the world or something. But um, yeah, but th that, that's the gesso is never left uncovered. Um, and it's really wonderful the way that my paint that is white looks on white gesso. Uh, it, it um, you know, it just has this really creamy depth that's uh, quite interesting, but anyway. Um, it says on these labels, you know, do not touch, they're fragile. So what's, what's the care and feeding of these pieces? Well, um, Uh, keeping children with backpacks away from them, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of the things that have caused problems. Um, having your cleaning person not put Windex on them. Um, or the cleaning person who did put Windex on them, tell them not to use a Sharpie to try to fix it. <laughs> or... Um, I can put this in my driveway while my house is being built and run over it with a forklift. <laughs> I mean, it goes on and on and on. Those are the, the most extreme. Falling off the back of an airplane onto a tarmac. Um, those, are, those are the funny things. But basically, you just need to keep your hands off them. And, which is hard because, you know, you want to, you know, and um, if, you have, if you have cotton gloves on, you can touch them softly, and that's how you would dust them. Uh, old cotton knit t-shirts with no seams. That's lightly dust. The dust won't stick. The surface is hard enough, so nothing will... I mean, sometimes other foreign substances from the atmosphere can get attached, but that can happen to any painting. Um, and paintings get covered with, you know, dust and pollution and all sorts of things. And there's ways of cleaning that. It's not easy. It isn't for any painting to restore stuff like that. But you don't have to... They, they are very, very uh, impervious to cold. I've had some of these stored at my camp in Aroostook County in, the, in an unheated attic of my garage, some of them for decades, where the temperatures can get 40 below zero and nothing has happened to them. That same space can be like 150 in the summer and nothing's ever happened to them. That gets back to how the boxes are made, too, because they're really not panels, they're hollow boxes. And they're torsion construction, there's no hardware in them, and they're three-dimensionally consistent. They don't have a grain, so it's a particulate material, it's MDF which is three-dimensionally the same, no matter which way you cut it up. And that, you can sort of make them into solid sculptural objects, which makes them very, very strong. 
and also resistant to humidity, resistant to warping. Um, they, you know, they don't like getting wet, but most art doesn't. Um, but they, uh, and, and then there's, there's little repair things for tiny scratches that you can fix. And then I charge $200 an hour to fix them. <laughs> I may even go up on that. <laughs> Anyway, yes? Damage aside, um, you mentioned rust. Do they change over time? Um, there was, there was a, a, a body of work I did that worked with, uh, with bronze and with um, other metals that would easily oxidize. And then I would push the oxidation, like adding acid, vinegar, whatever, to, to create patinas like you would on, on sculpture. Um, so there's, I've, I've done that, but the, um, no, these aren't going to rust. And, and they're really resistant to fading. Um, I mean, I don't know, I have no idea how long they'll last for, you know, down, way down the line, but I've had works on paper, oil on canvas, and of course photographs and drawings that have, have fared far worse than anything that these have done in, in sunlight. Um, and, and I didn't, I didn't plan that. I think it has something to do with the fact that there is, the combination of materials is just very stable. And that compression I talked about is like, that stuff is just molecularly smashed together. And it's not just like, you know, pastels on the surface. It's really packed in there solid. And, you know, if you, any of you did the ceramics, you know that burnishing clay can make something that is porous hold water by just aligning the molecules of that material. Um, you can make that thing be resistant to almost anything without even firing it in a kiln. So that happens a little bit here too, that you're kind of making a skin on it that is uh, very resistant to any change. So you're glazing over enough here? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you for coming. I enjoyed it. <laughs>